thank you, Lord. We thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for that which you're yet to do. And we commit ourselves afresh to your care and into your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of Ephesians, we're going to begin chapter 3 this morning. Uh, but as I was looking at this, I, I was reminded of something. Uh, I am a focuser. <laughs> My wife is a multitasker. When, when, when we have the remote for the television going down, you know how you have the little menu thing that you can scan through what's on the channels? She like does it so like lightning fast that I can't even look at it. It's because I focus and I'm looking at one channel at a time, most of which is not worth even turning to. But uh, that's how I'm wired, and, and I focus on it. And she sees the whole thing. She's able to process all of that information. I can't watch television and talk with her at the same time. So I like the fact there's a pause button. At any rate, when I'm looking here, I'm looking at the Apostle Paul. <laughs> and here he is chained to a Roman guard in, in Rome, in, in prison. And he, is, he, he has this amazing ability to multitask uh, mentally. He, he's mentally uh, going through and looking at, he had the ability to look at several things at a time, but he also had the ability to focus. He's a brilliant man. And as we've looked at this book, we see in Ephesians chapter one, that here the apostle Paul, it's like he, he draws in a big deep breath and he goes with this long run on sentence talking about the blessings of God uh, and that he's able to do that. And then he keeps rabbit trailing. I like that about him. Uh, if you know me, you know, I love that aspect of it. Uh, but here in chapter three, it's kind of similar because he starts the chapter, and, and it, no chapter breaks in the original, but when he begins to speak here, he's been talking about, as we looked at in chapter two, the Gentiles being uh, added in, the, the, the separation between Jew and Gentile being taken out of the way and all. And now he's going to begin to pray, but he gets one thought out as far as what he's going to put up for his prayer, and he rabbit trails again. So uh, he intends to, to, to do this, but the reason why is that he was really concerned uh, that the Gentiles come into an accurate understanding of what God had done in, in, in the, the work of redemption, the work of reconciliation, which, which we've been looking at reconciling man to God, reconciling the Jews and the Gentiles together. And, and he hits back off in that direction again. Uh, there was centuries of hostility, of, of enmity. That's the word that's used, which, which means hostility uh, between Jews and Gentiles. The Jews had been given the oracles of God and, and that now in the new covenant with Messiah, the gospel had gone out to the Gentiles. There, was, there were two words that really described the relationship between Jew and Gentile that we've looked at, and one is separation. They were separate. The Jews were absolutely separated from the Gentiles in their minds, and the other is hatred. And so it, this isn't hyper, hyperbole. It, it, it's, it's the way it was, hyperbole being overstating to make a point. No, this is actually how it was. Uh, this tremendous hatred that, that went on. The, the Jews would refer to the Gentiles as dogs, and, and they weren't talking about house pets. They were talking about these wild cur-type dogs. I mean, the, the wild pack dogs that roamed the streets, that you didn't want to cross them or you were going to get bitten. They were, they were wild and, and unrestrained. And they also uh, loved to kind of look down their noses at the Gentiles as we are the circumcision, and they are the... <clears throat> kind of disgusting, uncircumcision. That was their mindset. That was their attitude. And they were always reminding the Gentiles that they were not part of the elite club uh, of Judaism in that sense. So one of the things that's true is, is that the Jews were actually the holier of the two. The Gentiles often lived down to the labels that they had because they were pagans. They were, in that sense, heathenistic. They they were outside of uh, the covenants of God, outside of the commonwealth of Israel, as we've looked at and all of that. Uh, but the point is, is that uh, 
they were completely different from the Jews looked down their nose at the Gentiles. They, they, they were not a part of it. So the question then becomes is how on earth do you bring these two groups together? How does that work? How do you, how do you heal this hostility? How do you get rid of this, this enmity, this, this hatred that's there? Uh, and I, I, want you to, I want to give you a, just an illustration here to give you an idea of the mindset of the Jews in the first century. So picture this. You've grown up in a very close-knit, affluent family. You and your siblings agree that you're a very special family, so much so that you've actually become really prideful about your family and, and about its standing in the community and all. Uh, and you love to boast of, about your father. Your father's well-known, and, and, and you know that you're his kid. And, and you boast about that. You, you even go so far as to say, we're dad's favorite. We, you know, we're sort of a cut above. Uh, <laughs> as, as you look at this, you look at it, and perhaps your father, as I mentioned, is, he's, he's affluent, and, and you know that he has great wealth and, and influence, and, and you also know that that wealth is what you stand to inherit. That's well known. So all of that's in place, that you're part of this, this deal, and then one day your father shows up with a ragamuffin chain. You know what a ragamuffin is? It's a dirty street person kind of a thing. This, with, he shows up with a ragamuffin child. He's dirty. He's brought him in off the street. Not only that, but this same child has been a tremendous bully towards you and your family for years. He doesn't like your family. He doesn't act like your family. He doesn't have the same values as your family. On top of that, he really doesn't care. This kid is creepy. He, he's just, he's not part of your, your deal, not part of your gig. Uh, there's a long history, you know, when, with this kid. You, you know that this kid, you've got all, his ancestors and your ancestors. I mean, you're talking the Hatfields and the McCoys going back generations that there's just been an ongoing battle between them. Into this, your father brings this kid in and, and, and this outcast child, and he tells you, meet your new brother. I have adopted this child into our family. He's been freely given equal rights and privileges as everybody else. Nothing will be required of him but to simply belong. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, he, he's a joint heir. He's going to get an equal part of your inheritance. You're going to share with him equally. We're talking this morning about the mystery of Christ and what God did with the Gentiles. This, I mean, that illustration really spells out, I mean, what would your reaction be to this? Be honest, folks, to, to, to this, this whole thing that all of a sudden things shifted and you know that, that this person has been given everything that you've ever been given, that this person is now part of your family, that you're a brother or a sister. It's, it's like it, the, the visceral reaction that comes from that accurately describes how the Jews felt about the Gentiles. What God has been doing through the Apostle Paul here is illustrating, and in many other places in the New Testament, that you and I, the Gentiles, anybody that's not Jewish, are that ragamuffin child. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says that, that, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And we're going to look at that as we go along this morning, just how this, this enmity was worked out what the mystery of Christ is, was, and is, and, and the, the fact that God does this miraculous thing because the Jews are no longer, they no longer have Yahweh to themselves. He's taking the roughest of the rough, marching them into their midst, and announcing that he has the exact same rights as them, added to the family of God. That's what we looked at last week. We looked at the family of God. So God unites these two 
very different groups with common realities. He says, you have a common Savior. It's no longer we have our thing and, oh, there's the rest. There's the Gentiles. No, it, you have a common Savior. You have a common Holy Spirit. You have a common Father. Uh, and, and in all of that, we share a common salvation. Does it matter if you're Jewish? Does it, does it matter if you're Gentile? We've looked at that, not slave or free or male or female. It doesn't, none of that matters. It's all been pushed out of the way because the, the field has been leveled. There's Christ, his work on the cross, his, his love for you is poured out, and, and, and those distinctions don't even come into play. As we look at this, we look at the mystery of Christ. The Greek word is mysterion. <laughs> it's not a big uh, jump from English to Greek, uh, but it's not a mystery. If you look at this word, it's not a mystery in the way that we look at mysteries, uh, uh, like something that's unknowable. It, what, what we're talking about here when we look at a mystery is it's not something that's unknowable, but something that's not previously known, and there's a distinction there. So now... We see that God sends the Messiah into the world to save all men equally. He reveals that Jew and Gentile have the same need for salvation. And now being saved, we all become part of the same family. That's the context that we look at as we get into chapter 3. So as I mentioned, Paul begins chapter 3 with a prayer. And he says this in verse 1. He says, for this reason, everything we've been talking about, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles... So what he says is he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He says, he doesn't say I'm a prisoner of Rome because politically he was, but he was there. He was in prison, not because of any wrongdoing in his life at all. He recognizes that he's in prison because he was being faithful to, to that which God had commissioned him to do. He had been called to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. He says, for you Gentiles. He's in prison falsely, persecuted for the faith. His legal problems began with one word, and we're going to trace it back. When Paul was initially arrested, they began with the word Gentiles. Anybody that's not Jewish. In Acts chapter 22, Paul's making a defense. Now, he'd gone to Jerusalem, and, and there he, he's wrapped up his, his uh, third missionary journey, and, and he's in the city, he's teaching, he's proclaiming Christ, and uh, uh, some, it says that some Jews from Asia incited a riot. They got the people whipped up. And, and so these people are trying to kill Paul now because of his testimony of Christ. And the soldiers get word of it. They go down and they get a hold of Paul. And Paul begins to address them in Greek. As I mentioned, this guy was brilliant. He spoke four languages, uh, he probably you know, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, uh, and Aramaic. And he, so he was able to be very cross-cultural with these people. So with the Romans, he spoke to them as a Roman. With the Jews, he spoke to them as a Jew. So Paul starts talking to the Romans in Greek, and, and that kind of gets them scratching their head. And he asks for, and he gets permission to address the same crowd that's trying to kill him. Now then, he turns to the Jews, and he begins to speak in their native tongue, Hebrew. And when, when he does that, they get very attentive and very quiet. They settle down, and now they're beginning to pay attention to what he's saying. So breaking into the story here in, in Acts 22, after Paul had shared his uh, miraculous conversion on the, the road to Damascus, he continues speaking to the crowd because he has their attention now. And in Acts 22, 17, we read this. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him, Jesus, saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by consenting to his death and guarded the clothes of those who were killing him. And then he, the Lord, said to me, Depart. For I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Verse 22. And they listened to him until this word. The minute they heard Gentiles, that was it. They were done. 
It says they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth. He's not fit to live. They were going to kill him. And, and then they, they, they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air. And, and so just imagine the scene, guys. We read this, and it's not like, and they tore off their clothes and they threw dust in the air and then they were upset and they were kind of having a bad... No, I mean, if you look, remember, like in news clips, you see in the Middle East where, where there's this tension and there's this, this fervor, this, this whole deal that rises up. And these people, they're just lashing out at anything they can and... You know, all of that. This is a scene. This is a huge scene. And, and so much so that the, the soldiers had to sweep back in and pull Paul away again. Uh, verse 24, the commander ordered him to be brought to the barracks. And they said that uh, he should be examined under scourging. So they might know why they shouted so against him. So, and that's where Paul, again, he returns this comment from the commander. And he says, is it law for you? lawful for you to scourge a Roman? And that got those guys thinking because he had rights as a Roman citizen. He was a Jew, and so he was part of the whole thing with Israel, but he was also a citizen citizen of Rome. And so they backed off. But the point is they barely got Paul out of there a second time. So in verse 1, Paul's saying, I'm here because I've delivered the gospel to you. In, in the face of great hostility from the Jews. What would happen with Paul from that point is he would begin to go through one trial after another, after another, after, that would eventually land him in Rome from that point. Like I said, his legal problem started with the word Gentile. And, and to where now in Rome, he's writing this letter back to a Gentile church, the church at Ephesus, and that's why he's laying these things out. He wants them to see what was happening on his side that caused him to be not a prisoner of Rome, but a prisoner of Christ, fulfilling his ministry. So he breaks from his prayer here as we get into to verse 2. He says, if indeed you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. The, the word dispensation here, it, it translates easily, actually, uh, into the word stewardship. Uh, that God dispensed this grace of, of God. He gave it to Paul as part of his commission, as part of his calling, uh, which was given to him for the Gentiles. Uh, he, he viewed the gospel of grace as a stewardship, a sacred trust with which he received from God himself. Uh, in Matthew chapter 16, there Jesus is there at Caesarea Philippi with his men, in those famous words, he says, who do men say that I am? And they say, you know, this or that. And then he says to Peter, he says, well, to the guys, he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. This was a pivotal point in Jesus's ministry because from that point, he said, now we're going to head to Jerusalem where I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of the religious leaders and crucified and I'll rise on the third day. But when he's having this discussion with these guys, Peter makes the statement, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says this uh, in verse 18 of Matthew 16. He says, and I say to you also that you're Peter, a little stone, and on this rock, foundational stone, foundational truth. What rock? The foundational truth that he's the Christ, the son of the living God. I will build my church. We're talking about the church here, folks. We're talking about Gentile and Jew. No, all brought into one now, being the church. He says, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In verse 19, he says something very interesting in, in Matthew 16. He says, and I will give you, there's that gift, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. In other words, what he's doing, in their culture, they knew that if, if a, a landowner was wealthy, uh, if, he had, if he had goods, if he had property, he had business dealings and all, if he was going to travel, then he would appoint stewards in his house. They would be the ones that were entrusted with the master's keys. That was very symbolic, very significant. They were entrusted with and appointed to represent their master's interest on his behalf. It'd be very much the same in our culture. If you guys know what a durable power of attorney is, uh, 
You can do limited power of attorney. You can do medical power of attorney. You can do all, but a durable power of attorney means that you become that person in your dealings. You have the authority to sign their name. You have the authority to, to deal with their property. You have the authority to enter into and pull out of business deals. You have the authority to bind and to loose. And that's what he's talking about here. These guys would connect with that. They'd understand that he's giving them the keys to the kingdom to be stewards of the kingdom of God. What he does here in Matthew 16 with his men he does later with the, the Apostle Paul, as Paul now recounts, I was given this stewardship of the, of, of the gospel of grace for you Gentiles. How did he do it? Verse 3, that by revelation, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, there's that word, as I've briefly, briefly written already. So Paul wanted them to know, I'm not making this stuff up. It isn't my, it, it, it's not something that I invented. This is, this is not something that I just came up with because I had some things I wanted to say. He, he's saying this is a sacred trust which he had received by revelation from God. The mystery that Paul speaks about, the gospel, ceased to be a mystery. Again, not a mystery that's unknowable, but it had not been known until the advent of Christ, until Christ came, until Messiah came. And then it was no longer not knowable, now it is knowable, and that's his point. It's no longer, it's the mystery, but it's a mystery that is now known. It had been hidden prior to that. He wrote briefly about it, in, as we've looked at in chapter 2, uh, in, in, as he says in, in verse 3, he says, I've briefly written already, verse 4, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So the apostles were the, the ones that were now representing Christ. And the prophets, we've looked at prophecy before. That doesn't mean that it was a group of guys that went around telling the future, necessarily. They, that, that's part of prophecy. But essentially, prophecy is what I'm doing now uh, the gift of teaching includes the gift of prophecy. You prophesy, it simply means to speak forth. So he's talking about the apostles. Yes, you could look at it in the context of the Old Testament prophets, but they didn't know that the mystery would be revealed. So what makes sense here is he's talking about New Testament prophets in that sense, people who were prophesying of this marvelous truth of the gospel. In the Old Testament, the salvation of the Gentiles in Messiah was prophesied, uh, but the coming together, the actual coming together of the Jew and the Gentile into the church is never spoken of. It was hidden. It was not part of anyone's understanding until these things came about. He's talking about a mystery. The mystery that was unknown until that time. It was also a mystery that came by divine revelation. Uh, Peter had the same experience, but, well, it was a different experience, but the same, essentially the same message there in, in Acts chapter 11. We'll look at it in a minute. But, but when he had the vision, he's there at, at Joppa, and, and he has this vision of the sheet, you know, with the corners and all that comes down uh, from God, and, and he sees the animals. He goes, no, 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 I'm paraphrasing. And God says, no, don't you call unclean what I have sanctified. That wasn't about dietary laws, guys. Some people interpret that way, and that's fine. You could take an interpretation from that. But truly, the interpretation in that for Peter was Peter was a Jewish boy. He was a good Jewish boy, and he understood Judaism real well. And his life had gotten turned upside down by this Jesus, the Messiah guy. And so there he is after the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and all that. And he has this vision to go to a guy by the name of Cornelius, who was a Gentile. And, and what God is doing in that vision is saying, Peter, there's no longer a difference. Don't call unclean what I have said, what I have called clean. And it was about the Gentiles. So Peter received a similar revelation. It was by revelation. It wasn't because somebody wanted to kind of make a new doctrine up. No, it was something that came directly from God, both for Peter and for Paul. Here's the mystery. Verse 6 tells us what the mystery is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. That's a bombshell statement. For these people, for the Jews, that's a, that is a huge statement. That is what 
puts them on an equal footing. That's what brings the ragamuffin child into the family. That is what makes them the same. It's the mystery of Christ, and it's been revealed. It's a mystery. Uh, the mystery wasn't that God had a desire to do good to the Gentiles. The law and the prophets had plenty of places showing that God had good intentions towards the Gentiles. The Jews didn't have a complaint that God would be good to them or gracious to them. They didn't have a complaint that God would even be inclusive of the Gentiles. That wasn't what they looked at. The, the thing that stumbled them, the thing that was the, the deal breaker for them, was that God would make them equal. They didn't like it. They still don't. They reject Jesus the Messiah on this basis. And in verse 6, he says three things here. He says they're fellow heirs. Check that. Note that. Fellow heirs. Equal. He says they're, part, they're, they're of the same body. No distinction. They're partakers of God's promises. And, and that's the promise of salvation in Christ, not through law, but through the gospel of the grace of God, which Paul had been entrusted with. This would be totally new and radical. It's a radical departure from everything that they had known and what had been the norm until then. And Paul is laying this out. You're not second class because you're not a Jew. You're equal. And that's God's specific will. And folks, you and I, unless you're Jewish, you and I are Gentiles. And this is the explanation that adds us by faith. When we come, we give our lives, we entrust our lives to Jesus. We turn from our sin. We turn from the old life and we embrace him. This is the nuts and bolts of the transaction. This is why we can become children of God. Why we can become part of the family of God. Because God changed things in, in, in revealing this mystery of Christ to the world. Jewish believers in the first century, they struggled with this. In Acts chapter 15, uh, we see that Paul and Barnabas, they're at Antioch. He, he was winding up his first missionary journey, and they had gone to Antioch, which is uh, up sort of near the coast of the northern part of, of um, well, southern part of Syria, northern part of Israel. They'd gone to Antioch up there, and, and, and at the end of chapter 14 in Acts, it said that God had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Acts 15.1 says this, it says, A certain man came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So essentially what they're saying is, come on now, you've got to do some Jewish stuff. And, and Paul and Barnabas had a heated debate with these guys that came and did that. They, they said, no, that's not it. It's by grace. It is by the grace of God alone. Uh, and, and the debate went on that they ended up going up to Jerusalem to seek the apostles and to find out what their opinion was on all of it. And they, that's what's called the Jerusalem Council. And in Acts 15, 6, I'm going to skip a couple of verses here. It says, now the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, in other words, it was a big argument, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know what a good, that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's talking about that vision that he had that we read about in Acts chapter 10. He says, so God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them, the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, the Jews, and made no distinction. Pay attention to that, guys. Made no distinction between us and them purifying their hearts by faith, no longer by law. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? He's saying, why do you want to go back to this external works thing? It's not on that basis. It's not about keeping rules. It's about God's unmerited favor towards you, towards me, towards them that Peter's talking about. He's saying, we couldn't bear it. We, nobody could keep it. Nobody could live up to the, the, the law of Moses. And, and to, to, to begin now to compel people to live by that is to actually add to the work of the cross. And you don't want to add to that, folks. 
It's not on the basis of works. Yes, we are saved unto good works, uh, works as we looked at in chapter 2, but that's not the basis of our salvation. It's not what these guys uh, came down and, and told the, the people at Antioch. The, essentially, Peter's standing up and he's saying, no, you guys were right to take issue with them on that. It, you don't have to be circumcised. Why would you put a yoke on them that we couldn't even bear ourselves? He says, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. So Peter got it. Peter understood that this shift had taken place. And, and, and he was very vocal about it there at the Council of Jerusalem. The Jews would continue to struggle with this, though. It, it, they were stumbled. Because they were stumbled, it didn't mean that they were rejected by God. In Romans 11, we see it, that Paul, the apostle, says, I say then, have they, the Jews, stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So God's not finished with the Jews. He's not finished with Israel. And, and I've, I've encouraged you before, read Romans 9, 10, and 11, and you'll see that he has a, a love for these people. The Apostle Paul had a great love for his countrymen, knowing that they were rejecting, knowing that they struggled with adding the Gentiles in, that they, 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 they were having a great deal of difficulty dealing with that. So he says here in verse 6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, of the same body, the partakers of the promise of Christ through the gospel. Uh, verse 7, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Interesting. He says, I became a minister. The word there, it's the word diakonos, and it means it's the same word that's translated deacon or servant. Uh, when we see Stephen, the, the, the first martyr of the church there in Acts chapter 7, and all where uh, when he is stoned for his testimony of Christ, it says that when they had trouble with uh, serving the widows in that day, that they appointed deacons to go into wait tables because the apostles were busy bringing the word of God forward. And so Stephen was open to being used as a servant as a table waiter. And so when Paul is saying this, he's not saying, hey, I'm the, I'm the mighty Paul. He's saying, you know what? I've assumed the role of a servant to bring the gospel to you. I, he says, I became a minister uh, according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So he's coming from the pinnacle of Judaism. You've got to realize this guy, he was top stop. He was uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, and, you know, as to the law found blameless, all of that stuff we read about in Philippians chapter 3, he knew his stuff. And he said, I, I've forsaken it all to be a servant, to bring the gospel to these people that formerly were far off, and now they've been brought near. He's seeing these ragamuffin children He's seeing their lives transformed by the effective working of his power, by the power of the gospel of grace, by the power of God working in them as equal, having equal status in God's kingdom. It was difficult for the Jews. It wasn't difficult for the Apostle Paul. It wasn't difficult for Peter. They understood what God was doing. They understood the mystery of Christ. And they understood that they were being used to reveal it. Did they get pushed back for it? Yeah, they did, quite a bit. But they were faithful to their calling, and they delivered the gospel to the Gentiles as God had ordained it to be done. Paul's is saying essentially here, he's saying, I'm not too good to be used by him. However, whatever, with whomever, I simply want to be obedient to what God is calling me to do. He knew his place. And, and Paul said, Christians, understand your place. Understand that we are that ragamuffin child, that we are that one who was brought in solely by the grace of God, and that now having been given a new life, given a new nature, 
that God wants to use us. Do you have a checklist of ways that you say, well, you know, God, I'll let you use me here. I'll let you do this through me. Oh, well, you know, I, no, I'm not going to do that. That's kind of below me. Maybe you don't say that, but is that the attitude of your heart that you're only going to be limited to what you want to do? I would encourage you, adopt the mindset of a servant. Jesus talked about it a lot in John chapter 13 when he washed his disciples' feet and he said, I'm doing this as an example for you. Now you go and you treat others this way, that you put other people ahead of yourself, that you adopt this diakonos mindset. Folks, that's how the body of Christ operates, that we are servants of the living God. We are not, if we're great, we're great in our own eyes. And Jesus is very clear. He says, you want to be great? Become the servant of all. That's the point. That's what Paul is living out here. The words of Christ are there. So we've looked at this. It, it wasn't difficult for him. He understood his place. He'd gotten over himself, and he understood that it was a gift to preach this gospel. He was completely reliant on the working of the Holy Spirit. Do you, again, when it comes to serving the Lord, do you limit yourself because you say, well, I could never do that? Perhaps your issue is not that you think you're above it, but you think you're below it. Perhaps you're thinking, well, I, I don't have the, the gifts. I, I'm not a good speaker. Well, good. You're in good company. Neither was Moses. Perhaps you're saying, well, you know, I, I don't know how I would. I've got this real burden in my heart to serve the, the Lord in a particular way. And other people are bearing witness. That's an important part of it, folks. And, and, and you want to be able to reach out or you want to be able to participate or to do something. It doesn't matter if it's cleaning floors or if it's speaking to thousands. It, it, it's, that's not the point. The point is, as we looked at in Hebrews chapter 13, he doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And if he's calling you, if he's pressing you, we have people in our church that are involved in ministries that there was no concept of. Two and a half, three months ago. None. I, I see people stepping up. I see people serving in ways that I, it's just awesome to watch. And I know that it's because of the effective working of God's power within them. This isn't just something that was for the Apostle Paul. This is something for you and I. That we can be used of God in ways that are way beyond our understanding, way beyond our abilities, way beyond our talents. Are you willing to simply be used? Are you willing to be that person that just picks up the phone and calls someone to say, just wanted to tell you I love you and see how you're doing? Are you willing to be that person that says, you know, I don't know if they're hungry, but God's burdened my heart and I'm going to drop some groceries. At you know, whatever it is, whatever it is, pray. Ask God to use you. I guarantee you, he will give you, if you're willing, he'll give you the heart of a diakonos. The heart of a servant, the heart that Paul had here, the heart that Jesus spoke of regularly through his ministry, and that he demonstrated in the upper room the night before he went to the cross. As I mentioned, he was completely reliant on the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. He had an accurate view of the Lord. He also had an accurate view of himself. As we look at this, we look at, at verse 8 here. He says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the, un, the unsearchable riches of Christ. He says, I'm, I'm less than the least of the saints. I believe that Paul received God's forgiveness for the, his former life, because his former life, as we looked at in Acts, was, was that of persecuting Christians. He went around, he stood by and approved of their, of their being killed. He rounded them up and put them in prison. He hated the church. He hated the people of Christ. And, and until God got his attention, he was absolutely vigorously opposed. I don't think he ever forgot that. He received God's forgiveness for it, but I don't think he ever forgot his former life. And yes, God's forgiveness is there. Yes, it's tangible and it's real. Yes, he will forgive you. It doesn't matter what you've done. I praise God for his forgiveness in my life. 
I praise God that his mercies are due every morning. I praise God that, that he wants to use me not because of who I am, but because of who he is. And what he's saying here is I'm less than the least of all the saints because he's, he has an accurate view of himself. He understands where he is in the order of things. He says this grace was given. Not I, he did that because I was all that and more. No, I was all that and less. He said that I should preach among the Gentiles. I count it a privilege to be uh, the person who is giving this gospel of the kingdom to these people who formerly were utterly rejected, to these people who were totally into their pagan practices, into their false worship of a pantheon, a number of gods, into all of the immorality and all of the things that the, the, the Gentile world represented in that day, very much like our world today. He said, that's, I, understand, I understand all of that. I remember it, but I know that I'm a new creation in Christ. He was the first partaker of this, folks. Yes, as I mentioned, he was a Jew, but he also came from a Gentile region in that world. He came from uh, the province, and we won't get into all of that. But, but he, had, he lived in both worlds. He lived in the Roman world, and he lived in the Jewish world. So he saw both sides. What he talks about here is the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you look at your relationship with God as being a recipient of his unsearchable riches? As I mentioned with that illustration when we began, here you're part of this family, this elite family. You're part of this deal that you, man, you're, you're it. And, and that your father comes in and he brings in this one from the outside. And he pours, he piles the family riches on him. That's you. That's me. We've been given great status in the kingdom of God. Not higher, but lower. Because God he says he resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. That's part of it, folks. That's part of what God wants to do and to accomplish in my heart and in your hearts today, every day. Are you staying current with the Lord? Are you, are you in a place where your life is open before him? Great value in that. I know my life. I know my past. I know the, the life that I live. And I praise God for his grace. Perhaps you're in a place this morning where you know your background. You know that you've lived your life away from God. I just want to tell you that if that's you, if you're feeling the stresses, the pressure of life in this world in these days, if you're feeling hopeless or despairing, you don't have any answers, we find answers here. God will give us the ability, if we are open, to live a life that is not dependent on my circumstances as to whether I have contentment in my life or not, but to live a life that where I find true contentment, I find true meaning, I find true hope, I find true peace through this power of the gospel of the grace of God. I and it, it comes about by simply saying, Jesus, I believe that you died for me, that you bridged the gap between me and God, that my sins separated me from God. And I'm turning from those. I'm asking for you to forgive me for those and to cleanse me and to add me to the family. And he'll do it. He'll give you full status in the family not based on what you've done, where you've been, and not, as Paul says here, because you're the, 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 the less than the least of the saints, but because of who he is, because of who Jesus is and his ability to save completely to the uttermost. If that's what you're doing, I want to ask you to pray a prayer that sounds something like this. God, I, I know where I've been, 
and I know what my life has looked like till now, and I, I, I just pray, Father, uh, I pray that as I turn from this old life, as I, as, I, as I forsake the way I've been living, and I embrace Jesus as I turn to the cross, trusting my life with you, if that's what you're doing, he will fill you with his Holy Spirit. He will fill you with power. He will radically alter the way that you look at life and the way that you look at the things going on around you. There is peace. Won't you do that today? Give your life to Christ. You'll never regret it. As we've been looking at this, looking at uh, this amazing mystery of Christ that's been revealed, we, we look at how... The Gentiles, anybody that wasn't Jewish was formerly far off, but now have been brought near by his blood. What a blessing it is as we apply these truths to our lives, as we say, Lord, what about me? I know that I was far off and, and you've brought me near. I am ever so grateful that this truth, these truths apply to us today. Yeah, written 2,000 years ago. Yeah, put down for their benefit but the application is timeless. The application is for you and for me today. Praise God that he did the work. Praise God that he opened the door to the Gentile world, to you and I, for this wonderful salvation. Not on the basis of whether you're circumcised or not, not on the basis of works, not on the basis of anything that I can bring, because the Bible tells me that my righteousness is as filthy rags, but on the basis of his goodness in his grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your grace, for your goodness towards us.